Uh, it sounds like people, it looks like people can hear me, so that is just excellent. Uh, we will get started in just a moment. Thank you much. All right, Dee, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today. It's just after 1 o'clock. We're going to get going for the first webinar of the, of the spring here. So very quickly, this is the, you're seeing on your page, the forestrywebinars.net portal page. Just a couple things we want to point out. There's some websites related to today. Those are uh, indicated. See, those are indicated right here. And then also there's some related files. There's the webinar slides today if you want to print those out. And there's also a fact sheet there as well. So these things will be available after the webinar uh, is finished. So feel free to get those if you'd like. Today we're going to be talking about invasive bamboo management in the southeastern US. Thanks for coming today. Again, this is uh, with the Forestry and Natural Webinars, Natural Resources Webinar Portal. Here is orientation. Hopefully most of you have figured this out already. If you cannot hear, uh, there's an audio setup wizard in this little that, that circles off just a little bit. There's a drop down menu right there. There's an audio setup wizard. There's also a chat box you can see, which some of you have already figured out. Feel free to, to type your questions into the chat box anytime today. I will monitor those and save those for later. Also be aware that, yes, there's a little bit of big brother going on here. So as moderators, I can see everything you put in that chat box, even if you direct message someone. All we ask is that you keep uh, the chats uh, to a minimum unless they're pertaining to the webinar. So again, for questions today, if you have questions throughout, feel free to type those into that chat box, and I will save them and host the Q&A at the end of the presentation. For those of you getting continuing education credits, there's SAF credits available today for watching this webinar and participating. Uh, remember, you need to take the survey at the end, take and pass that short quiz, and at the end I will pass out uh, a link to do that. And then there will be a form, and you will get these things. They will pop up on your computer uh, on their own. So if you have any problems, let us know if any of that. This is how to contact me, decoil at clemson.edu. I am with Clemson University Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation. Uh, if there's any problems during the webinar, feel free to put them in the chat window. Uh, afterwards, feel free to email me. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dee Lawrence, and she is with the University of Florida. She is going to talk about invasive bamboo management in the southeastern U.S. Oh, well, quick question. We do not have ISA credits for this, I'm afraid. It is just SAF credits. So uh, with that idea, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I'm going to talk to you today uh, about how bamboo came on my radar here in Florida, um, give a little background in uh, bamboo biology uh, and invasion risk, and uh, give some management strategies on how to control bamboo, and finally talk, talk a bit about some of the com commercial promotion of bamboo um, across the region. Um, but just a quick background on what I do here at the University of Florida. Uh, I am the coordinator of the UF IFAS uh, assessment of non-native plants in Florida's natural areas. It's a, it's a mouthful. Um, but what we do is provide recommendations for the use of non-native species in the state. Uh, and we have a database of over 900 species um, that we've assessed with various risk assessment tools, um, which is kind of the journey that I took to get into this bamboo uh, issue. Um, but to get started, uh, just a background on, on how I ended up working on bamboo. In Florida, um, we, we have an issue where um, farmers are looking to diversify crops, um, especially with some of the, the issues we're having here with citrus decline and uh, laurel wilt. Um, so, so we've become an area where folks can come in and promote uh, biomass stock species. Um, so this might be for biofuels or paper pulp um, and some other, other uses. Um, a couple of examples here, we have industrial hemp, which is becoming very 
hot topic right now. Um, and pongam oil tree are both species that have gone through our assessment program as a part of um, the Florida Department of Agriculture's uh, permitting process um, on whether or not they, are, they will allow planting of some of these species. Um, so a lot of the alternative crops that come across my desk for, for different reasons, uh, whether it's permitting or if we're going to do some research at the university on it, um, a lot of these species tend to share key traits with invasive species. And some of those traits include um, high establishment rates. Uh, these species are very tolerant to low resource environments. Um, so think about um, plants that can do very well in marginal habitats. Uh, they're known to have rapid biomass accumulation. And in a lot of cases, they're very, uh, they produce a lot of seeds in a short amount of time. Um, many of these species are being aggressively marketed um, as, as farmers in, in Florida strive to diverse, diversify their crops. Um, there we go. Um, in particular, we, we have a big problem with our citrus industry. Uh, it's been in decline for, for a number of years, uh, in part to uh, multiple introductions of citrus canker. Um, which is a bacterial infection that causes early fruit drop on our, our orange trees. Uh, and more recently, um, more recently, uh, citrus greening, which is a, another bacterial in infection that's vectored by uh, the Asian psyllid. Uh, this causes tree decline and fruit drop as well, uh, and it's estimated to cause about four and a half billion dollars of lost revenue in uh, approximately five years. Uh, so this is what, if you drive through Central Florida, you'll see a lot of this uh, in the landscape, these abandoned citrus groves. So these trees are dead. Uh, this, this particular grove is for sale by owner, and uh, they're, they're walking away from their property. So this land becomes available for more development. Uh, so you'll take something that was once an ag land and uh, punch in some more McMansions. Urban sprawl uh, is, is something that we're experiencing down here in Florida. Um, or if people just walk away, uh, these become refuges for other invasive species. So this is a lot of acreage that used to be managed by the citrus grower, but now it's not being managed, and you're seeing uh, coven grass coming in, other invaders, Lagodium, uh, and, and the like. And when we consider that citrus brings in $1.5 billion, or 18% of all of our state revenue, uh, this is a big deal uh, for, for, for us in general. So we've got companies that are coming in and promoting some of these um, crops as alternatives, including uh, bamboo, which is being aggressively marketed to citrus farmers in the state. Uh, there is no, no number that I can give you in terms of acreage, um, but from what I've seen on social media from the companies that are promoting the species, we're looking at at least uh, 20 to 100 plantings, anywhere from 2 to 10 acres. Uh, on average per, per, per planting. Uh, and here's one of the companies, you can go to their website and see what, how they're marketing their, their crop uh, online there um, with, with some facts that, that they provide about bamboo. Uh, in Alabama, there's a, a similar story happening, but instead of citrus, they're uh, focusing on the Black Belt region. Uh, where you're finding uh, eco economic opportunity uh, is depressed, they're directly uh, targeting African American farmers uh, with these 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 promotions uh, and touting uh, the crop as being, or the, I'm sorry, Alabama as being an ideal place to plant such crops because of the soil, the climate, the amount of rainfall and the amount of acreage uh, that's available for planting. Uh, they promise uh, to rejuvenate degraded lands, uh, prevent erosion, and offer increased carbon sequestration. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, 
science backing this up yet. I think there's a lot of room to do some really cool research on carbon budgets uh, and and whether or not it rejuvenates the land uh, is not not immediately clear. In the greater southeast region, so looking at, at the, the rest of the states, I gave you two examples and now uh, the southeast in general, there are companies that are promoting bamboo throughout the region. Uh, and here are these photos show uh, a farmer took, took out pine to put in a uh, giant running bamboo planting in North Carolina. So you can see where they, uh, they took out these pines um, to, to plant the bamboo. Oh, there we go. Um, so I've, I've found um, some documented evidence that this is happening in Arkansas, both the Carolinas, Georgia, Texas, Louisiana, um, all the way through to Mississippi, and uh, there, there is some marketing going on in the Pacific Northwest as well. So the background on how this bamboo fact sheet came into um, uh, being is I've been dealing with questions from our extension agents throughout the, the state and farmers contacting me directly about, you know, what, what do we think about bamboo? The company that's promoting bamboo in Florida was trying to get the University of Florida to plant demonstration plots on our various um, research facilities around the state. Um, and so we were getting questions from university folks about that. And um, this isn't something that we wanted to do uh, and, and not a practice of the university. Um, but furthermore, we realized that there wasn't a lot of information out there for uh, the extension agents. Um, I've been dealing with bamboo uh, since pretty much my first day on the job. I've been with the assessment for six years. Um, one of my first uh, risk assessments was on a running bamboo species. Um, so I had a lot of experience dealing with it down here in Florida, and a couple, about a year ago, I get on Twitter and I see a tweet from David uh, about how he was dealing with bamboo as an extension agent. Um, so I messaged him and it came out, well, Nancy's been dealing with it as well. So we got together um, and brought in a team of experts uh, to put together this, this uh, fact sheet for the region so that we can get some information out to our extension professionals in the area. Um, so this was a collaborative effort across uh, many land grant institutions uh, and the Southern Regional Extension Forestry uh, helped to make it, make it so. Um, so that's the background. That's how I got interested in bamboo and what led up to the, the fact sheet. Um, and now we're getting into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. Um, I'm going to give you uh, some information on the bamboo basics, the origin of the species, where, how they grow, um, some life history traits and, and invasion risks, and then go into a section on control methods and finish out with some more thoughts about growing bamboo for commercial purposes. So uh, bamboo is a perennial grass. Um, depending on where you're looking in the, in the literature, you'll see a range of 1,000 to, to 1,400 species of uh, bamboo that have been classified. Um, most of these species are native to Asia, Africa, and South America. Um, they range uh, in height and um, some of the other aspects of it, you, you know, the, the, the coloration of the leaves, the coloration of the combs. Um, there's a lot of diversity within bamboo, but you can see here the range in height can be knee high for these dwarf bamboos, um, up to very large, uh, large bamboo um, on your right. And this is a bambusa species in South Africa. I got this photo from my colleague Susan Canavan, who had done her PhD work on bamboo in South Africa. So it's not just in the United States we're dealing with this. Um, but just wanted to point out that her mother is in uh, in this photo for scale, so you can just see how enormous uh, you know these these bamboo clumps can get. She also Susan also provided um, these are maps from her PhD work where um, she looked at where 
uh, bamboo species were their origins, uh, where, where they're native. Um, and this is a heat map. So the larger the dot or the circle, the more species come from that country. Uh, so you can see just how much is coming from the Asian countries, uh, with China pr providing uh, quite a bit of bamboo diversity, uh, and also Central and South America in the yellow. And here, whoops, my bad. Sorry, I'll take it back one. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is the, if you'll notice in the United States, you see just one dot there. Um, so there's only one, relatively one species there, um, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, we do have a lot of bamboo in the United States, um, and this map shows uh, where those, it's a pie chart showing where they come from. So in, in the United States, the majority of the bamboos that are here come from Asia, um, with the next highest amount coming from Central and South America. And again, I'm going to point out um, that the one, there's one native bamboo species here in the United States. And so what is that native? Um, I've seen it as many as three species of a rundown area or, or down to one. I think this might be a question for the taxonomist. Um, so I present this as a genus. Um, so, so here are some photos provided by Nancy Lowenstein of uh, Switch cane, giant cane, river cane um, are the common names for, for a rundown area. Um, so you can see those photos there. Um, I do provide a link in the, uh, towards the end of the talk with some resources. Um, and one of those will be uh, something you can access to look at how to identify native uh, a rundown area. Um, but we'll get into the bamboo biology now. How, how does it grow? Um, I don't cover reproduction uh, in this talk um, simply because uh, bamboo produces uh, uh, seeds. Um, the majority of bamboo produces seeds uh, in a life cycle uh, between 30 and 120 years. So for the purposes of the assessment, we weren't worried about invasion, um, invasive spread from the seeds. Uh, um, so. So I can talk to you afterwards if you want to learn more about the, the sexual uh, uh, reproduction. Um, but we're going to focus on growth here. Uh, new culms emerge uh, from the ground. Um, so you have rhizomes below ground. And at the beginning of the growing season, new culms will emerge very quickly. Um, it's thought that these, you know, a lot of times you'll hear about the incredible growth rates of bamboo. Um, and he, the initial growth from um, the first the, in the spring is a redistribution of stored carbohydrates um, from the previous grow, growing season. Um, the growth that you see in a year is from that, those stores, not from the current photosynthesis of the plant. Um, the height and diameter of a culm will remain the same for the lifetime of the culm. Um, so each year, the culm doesn't grow any taller. Um, but each year, uh, each year's new culm will be taller than the previous year. So this is where the illustration comes in. So at planning, you had culms that were this tall. Uh, and then at year one, um, the culms remain the same height. Uh, but the new growth is, uh, is taller. Um, and then in year two, again, you see these year, uh, the two culms that were there at planting are still the same height. Uh, year one culms are still the same height, but then again, in, uh, the new growth becomes even taller and taller. Um, so, so it's just important to note that you're not going to see any expansion of those culms, um, you know, in terms of height or diameter once they've uh, reached their maximum height for that growing season. But uh, the combs that are there um, will put on new leaves every year. So in year one, you see here, um, you know, one, one branch with a few leaves. Year two, we put on 
uh, more branches, so you have more leaves. And by year three, we've expanded the amount of leaves on a comb, um, increasing photosynthesis, uh, you know, the, the capacity to, to capture light each growing season. Um, so bamboo can be divided into two, um, two types based on the rooting habit or rhizome type of those bamboo. Um, so the first one is the clumping bamboos uh, or pachyomorph. Um, you can see here in the illustration uh, these combs just come up very, uh, very tight to the main, the main comb. Um, they grow radially, producing very little horizontal growth. Um, so this results in a, a rather slow uh, spread, um, but pretty dense clump. So, so those clumps stay pretty close together. Um, clumping bamboo uh, or originates uh, from the tropical and subtropical regions, um, mainly from Asia, Africa, and South America. Um, and these species are not very cold tolerant. The second type is running bamboo. Um, these are leptomorph bamboos. Uh, you'll see that in the literature as well. Um, here you see uh, the rhizome tip uh, at the end of those, um, of those, of that, um, I'm sorry, the, at, at the rhizome there in below ground. I lost my pointer. Here it is. OK, here you go. So here's the rhizome tip. You can see at each of these nodes, you can have a comb that comes up. Um, but with this rhizome tip, you know, where the, whereas the clumpers were coming up, um, these just grow out, resulting in more horizontal growth. Um, these runners can send up multiple combs along the rhizome um, and have the capacity to spread. Uh, many of the, the bamboos that you'll see regulated across some of the states, um, up, particularly up in uh, New England, are running bamboos. Um, these, these types of bamboo are not very tolerant of cold, and they're generally better suited for temperate climates. Um, so in the capacity of what I do here at the ISIS assessment, one, one of the, the things that we do is risk assessment. Um, so we use uh, a model that's based on an Australian risk assessment for to, to determine the probability that a species will become invasive. Um, it's a series of 49 questions. Um, and depending on how you answer a question, yes or no, based on evidence, it'll give it each question a score. Um, typically, these are negative one to positive one, um, but some questions are weighted higher than others. So if you add up the cumulative score for each species, um, that tells you where that species falls into risk. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading the audio is sporadic. Uh, OK, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm hearing you loud yeah, and clear. Okay. I think you're OK. I, you're I was right. I'm sorry, I was distracted. Um, so as you add these scores together, it puts, puts your species into your categories of risk. Um, so. We did 13 species of bamboo for the Florida Department of Agriculture, and I, they were, some were clumping and some were running, and I noticed the pattern that the running species tended to have a higher risk. So I wanted to expand this and uh, increase our data set up to 47 species. Um, and you can see here are the running bamboos and the clumping bamboos. Overwhelmingly, the running bamboos tended to be a higher risk for invasion in the black. Uh, these grays are evaluate furthers, which means we didn't have enough information to place a species in either a high or a low risk category with any um, certainty. Uh, and we only had one running bamboo that uh, actually scored as a low risk. Similarly, we had one clumping bamboo that was a high risk for invasion. And again, um, over here you see many of the clumpers were uh, lower risk for invasion. Um, so we did another analysis, so we have all these questions within this risk assessment. Um, the important thing to take away from here is that um, the questions that were most influential to the, um, to the outcome of the assessment 
were questions about whether the species is invasive elsewhere. Um, so is it an environmental weed elsewhere? That means it does it does it impact natural areas, um, naturalization history, um, or whether it's a disturbance weed. And this seems very intuitive um, that if something, if a species is invasive elsewhere, it's a very good chance that it would be invasive here. Um, so there's a lot of evidence for some of these species that they, they do cause problems in other, um, other regions. So uh, what does a bamboo invasion look like? Um, again, these photos are courtesy of Nancy Lowenstein, um, but you can see here a pretty thick patch of bamboo uh, in a forested habitat. And just to point out that this is uh, bamboo competing with and coexisting with privet. Uh, and if, if anybody's familiar with privet, uh, you know that it can form some pretty dense stands. So this is, a, this is impressive. And this is a photo I took in Woodstock, Georgia, um, just to, to point out here um, those are nursery trucks. Um, there is a nursery growing facility um, to the right of the photo. Um, and this circle here is a giant patch of Phyllostachys aria, um, which is golden bamboo. And if you're seeing this bamboo in the southeastern part of the United States, um, th this is likely what you're seeing uh, invading uh, the understories and uh, roadsides uh, in the area. So thinking back to the, the beginning where we were talking about what species are being promoted for commercial uh, planting, in the southeastern region, region um, they are planting and promoting uh, Phyllostachys species, specifically Edulis and Rubro marginata. Um, Edulis is a high risk, and the uh, rubra marginata is uh, evaluate further. We do have new data on the, the second species uh, that we're going to be re bringing that through the evaluation process again. Um, I would predict that that is going to fall into the high risk category as well. Um, but notice that these are both Phyllostachys species, uh, and I just said uh, Phyllostachys aria is already uh, invading the region. So uh, these are species with high uh, invasion risk based on history of invasiveness elsewhere. Um, and we know that a congener is invasive where we are. So just want to make that loud and clear. Um, in Florida, they tried to plant the Phyllostachys species, but um, if you recall, uh, Phyllostachys is a runner. They tend to not do well in subtropical and tropical climates. They're more suited for temperate. Um, so the, they uh, switched gears and just started planting Dendrocalamus asper, which is a clumping bamboo. Now this one is uh, an evaluate further with, the, with our assessment tool. Um, again, this is we would exercise caution when recommending folks to plant this. There's not enough information um, on whether or not we could say it's going to be a problem or not be a problem. Um, so that's the background on the bamboo basics. Uh, we're going to go into the control methods next. Uh, we have provided a table in the bamboo fact sheet, uh, thanks to Dr. Stephen M. Enlow here at the University of Florida. Um, and what he had put together was a really nice table um, breaking down your your management strategies between prevention, physical control, uh, biological control, and chemical control. Um, here's your techniques and any important comments to help you make your um, manage, develop your management plans. I'm going to highlight uh, three out of the four of these groups. Um, I leave out biological control um, because uh, it's it's we don't have any classic biocontrol, and um, I think we can understand grazing, um, uh, not, not necessarily the most effective in this case. Um, but first, we start with prevention. Um, number one, we want to increase the awareness and educate the public about bamboo. Uh, and so when we started this, there wasn't a lot of information out there, uh, and it, at least in my case, my uh, the extension agents that were contacting me with questions uh, were were very uh, uh, they they were 
they had no idea what to tell um, tell the public. Uh, so by putting together things like that fact sheet, uh, I published a, a newsletter um, doing webinars like this. Uh, I presented at the Ford Exotic Pest Plant Council meeting, and uh, Nancy uh, presented a similar talk up at the Innovations Innovations in Plant Management meeting in Nashville in December. So we're trying to get the word out and educate the public uh, and also provide the right information for our extension agents um, so that they have uh, they have the knowledge to be able to pass on to the to the farmers uh, and the public coming to them. Um, we would also recommend that you avoid planting running bamboo just as a practice. Um, there are bamboo um, uh, there are laws on on the books up in the northeast about bamboo where folks are planting just for for um, you know, dividers between their property or just uh, landscaping, they'll plant a running bamboo and it will shoot into their neighbor's yard. Uh, eventually, uh, there's cases where it's compromised uh, neighbor's foundation causing property disputes. Uh, so for these reasons, um, they've put in laws, uh, different kinds of laws, um, either on a local or statewide scale um, to try to regulate running bamboos in particular. So just as a practice, it's not a great idea to plant running bamboo. Um, and we would advocate using caution um, when you plant clumping bamboo, um, you're going to want to make sure you manage those so they don't um, become a problem. Uh, and another preven preventative tactic would be to um, put in barriers or trenching. And so here is an example of a barrier where you dig in around your planting, and this is someone who really wanted to plant running bamboo. Um, so you put your barriers in, and I've heard of steel and concrete and rubber and um, just various materials that you put in as your barrier. Um, and you can see this runner just sort of bouncing off of the, the barrier, um, and then they recommend in, in the case where it jumps over your barrier to clip those off. Um, so there, there is one example of a barrier. Um, here's some trenching, some photos of uh, 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 how you can trench. Very similar, you just go in and put, put a trench around um, your bamboo. Um, and you want to maintain that and cut those, those um, rhizomes as they, as they pop into your, your, your uh, trench. For both of these examples, they're both very labor intensive uh, and expensive and um, wouldn't necessarily be the best option for larger areas. So if you put uh, 50 acres of giant running bamboo in, uh, into production in North Carolina, um, the odds that you're going to put a barricade or, or maintain a trench around those uh, would be very, uh, very expensive. Um, in a smaller, uh, in, in the category of uh, physical control, um, there are some methods that, that, that you can employ here, including rhizome excavation. Um, so literally, you're going to dig these things up um, with either using a root rake or a backhoe. Um, in general, rhizomes are fairly shallow in the soil, um, but you have to make sure you get all of those, those rhizomes out of the ground. Um, remember, at, at each of those nodes, um, uh, you can have a comb grow up. So if you leave, if you go through with a root rake or a backhoe and you pull these things out and you just leave a few rhizomes behind after that treatment, uh, you're going to have regrowth. Um, you can also use hand pulling or a weed wrench. Um, this is very, very labor, labor intensive and not necessarily practical um, for any kind of large scale um, management plan. That's something you could think about if you're trying to just keep something contained and fight sort of the, the, the front edge of it, of, of, a, of a grove. Um, you can also use um, mowing as a, a, as a control strategy. Um, I give the example here of a 20-foot mode buffer. This is, tends to be um, one of the best management practices that they use in Florida um, for biomass planning. So if you maintain the buffer around whatever non-native that you're planting, um, 
it's something that you continue to monitor and mow. Um, but if you're using it to control um, a population of bamboo, it would take a long time to exhaust your reserves. So you have to mow it, let it grow up, mow it, let it grow up. Um, and then finally, uh, we have this example of manual re removal of young combs. Um, so if you see here, this comb popping out of the ground is pretty soft, uh, and you can simply just kick it over um, to get those uh, out of production. Um, so the next couple of slides are on chemical control. And I have full disclosure, uh, I am an invasion ecologist and have not ever worn a backpack sprayer or done any land management. So these uh, details are provided by Stephen Enlo. Um, and so I'll, I'll try to answer any questions as best as I can at the end uh, regarding the chemical control. Um, but here, uh, the first example, you can cut and treat the stumps for re, uh, the stumps or the regrowth. Um, so you want to cut those things off uh, and apply glyphosate or, and uh, amazapyr at higher rates. Um, similar, similar to the cut and paint uh, method, um, this is pretty uh, pretty labor intensive uh, method and wouldn't necessarily be suitable for a large scale. Um, control strategy. Uh, and I'd also point out that as those bamboo combs get older, um, they get harder to cut. So as a bamboo comb matures, uh, it becomes more rigid. Uh, uh, and so it, it's harder to cut those things down to, to apply your treatment. Uh, we also have foliar applications. Uh, we have 5 to 10 percent glyphosate or 1 percent imazapyr. Um, you can tank mix the two. Um, simply, you're, you know, you're spraying this over your grove. Uh, one thing that I would point out is you're killing the foliage, uh, but you're still, you, you'll still have to deal with uh, what comes back from the rhizome. So again, you've got all those stored carbohydrates below the ground um, that, that are just waiting to, to regrow. Um, there's a basil bark method uh, where you put 20% trichopyr ester at the lower, uh, you apply that to the lower 18 inches of the plant. Um, this can be used as a spot treatment, um, but once you put this in a higher density application, um, you're going to hit your label, um, label limits uh, for how much you can put in a, uh, an area. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a granular example. Um, Imazapyr can control running bamboo, but it's very hard to achieve a uniform treatment um, on any kind of large scale. Uh, so there are some difficulties here with, uh, with the chemical control as well. Um, but we provide another example where um, you can combine a physical uh, a mowing treatment with a foliar herbicide treatment where you cut the bamboo down, um, you let it grow to three to four feet, uh, and then you're going to spray that foliage. Uh, the recommended time for treatment would be uh, September, October, um, when, when you're going to do that. Um, but the authors of, uh, of uh, we have an EDIS document that I'll provide a link to here at the University of Florida um, on bamboo control. Um, they caution that when you're using glyphosate, you might need to do this as many as four times. So this is, again, another labor-intensive method for controlling bamboo. Um, so now we'll go back to the final point, uh, the growing bamboo for commercial purposes. Uh, so here is a crop comparison chart uh, that's provided by one of these companies promoting bamboo. Um, and so here in this crop column, you'll see here's some traditional crops in the area and then bamboo. And so they're saying corn, you can get 50 to $200 per acre per year. I'm not exactly sure what this means, but pine trees, cotton, and wheat, ridiculous, is what you get back um, per acre per year. Uh, but um, what they are telling folks is that bamboo can provide 15 uh, to 25 percent, or I'm sorry, 50 to 25 thousand dollars per acre per year uh, return on investment, and they are a couple happy farmers uh, planning on cashing those checks. 
um, I have spoken to some uh, some folks affiliated with the American Bamboo Society and also some growers um, in in the the bamboo community who say um, you can make money on bamboo, but uh, twenty five thousand dollars per acre is uh, not a realistic return on investment. Um, so be advised of that. Uh, but beyond that, um, there are still some questions about production. Uh, we have no established BMPs, uh, best management practices, uh, beyond mit mitigating those invasion risks um, or an idea of a realistic idea of what, what it costs to put this production into play. Um, so we need to consider site preparation, the cost of the plants, whether or not um, you have to set up irrigation, uh, fertilization, and uh, herbivory control. And at least here in um, Florida, you know, we have a lot of uh, acreage in um, uh, sugarcane, uh, and there are some serious pests to sugarcane that could uh, that could also affect bamboo. Um, so there are some concerns there. Uh, labor costs. So how much is it going to cost to 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 put in these containment strategies? Plant the plants. Um, Again, those columns don't, they're not ready to harvest the year that they come up. So um, sometimes it takes three to seven years for the columns to reach the strength if you want to use it for um, building materials or um, flooring. So you have to mark those columns by year and be able to go back uh, and know what year you're harvesting. And similarly, you'll have to harvest in a selective manner. So, um, I'm just thinking in a very dense bamboo clump. If you're if you're producing that that clumping bamboo um, to go in selective cut, you know, three or four combs per per plant uh, each year might be difficult. Um, so these costs have to be quantified. Um, and then, what are the yield expectations, and how are we going to do that? Uh, what techniques are we going to go into harvest, and that? That again gets into um, the previous point. Um, and how does this compare to pine? Uh, I gave an example of someone taking pine out to plant uh, bamboo. Um, there's a reason why pine's been grown in the southeast for for uh, generations. Um, is bamboo a better option? Um, uh, that is unclear. Without a very uh, in-depth economic analysis. I don't, I don't know that we can answer these questions yet. Uh, what are the markets for the raw materials? What products are we growing these for? Um, some of the bamboo is being grown for biomass. Um, you can make paper and you can make clothes. Uh, you know, you can do a lot of things with bamboo. Um, you can also eat it. Uh, so if you harvest those, uh, those new soft shoots that are coming up, um, that can be used for bamboo shoots. There are also some, uh, uh, there's some interest in growing bamboo as a, a green crop. Um, it's getting marketed as a, a, a green, a green crop uh, for its ability to sequester carbon. Um, and there, there's a lot of claims that it's, um, it sequesters more carbon than pine, uh, but that's not necessarily clear. Um, it's more likely it's about the same. Um, but to answer or be able to talk about carbon sequestration, uh, you would really need to do a, a pretty in-depth carbon budget, uh, carbon budget model uh, like they do in Europe. So how much carbon is going into planting the plants versus how much the plants are uh, uh, sequestering in their lifetime? Um, and then transportation. So if we don't really have the infrastructure in the United States and we're growing all this bamboo here, um, but we can't, we can't process the, the material, we're going to have to ship that to places that do have that infrastructure. And this also adds to your carbon budget. Um, if you're shipping all of these products over to um, Asia, where, where um, for those to get pr uh, processed, we're adding to, to that issue as well. Um, in both carbon costs and um, cost to the producer. Um, and then finally, what support systems um, exist for this, uh, for this species or for this crop? 
Um, so again, we've talked about how uh, a lot of this work on bamboo started because the extension agents were contacting us and didn't know uh, know what to say. The information isn't there. I think at each step of these uh, questions about production, there's room for research uh, in an interdisciplinary way um, that can tease out some of these questions um, to really let us know if bamboo is a viable cropping system um, for the area. Um, so there are some other, uh, other risks with e ecology and, and health concerns. Um, we know that very little grows under bamboo when you get a dense grove. Um, between the shade and the leaf litter, uh, this, this results in minimal wildlife habitat. Um, there's also some health concerns. So in a dense grove, you might have a higher instance of histoplasmosis, uh, which is a fungal lung disease that's associated with birds roosting in these stands. Um, so if you've got folks out there marking combs without proper protection, uh, um, you know, breathing protection, uh, they could be exposed to histo or, or contract histoplasmosis, which could be very serious. Um, and then plantings that aren't properly contained, or if a farmer walks away from them, those those plantings will spread. Uh, so we're rounding the corner to the end here. Um, in summary, uh, the majority of the bamboo that's planted in this region for commercial purposes um, are those running species. Uh, with the exception of Florida, where we have a, a clumping bamboo. Um, it should, I hope it was clear in the uh, management section that once it's established, it would be very difficult to control, um, especially if you're looking at um, um, some of the larger populations that you're trying to eradicate. Um, we know that there's little information regarding uh, the economic costs and benefits of, uh, of growing bamboo commercially um, and that best management practices haven't been developed yet. Um, we're not clear about the markets for these uh, raw materials. We do know that bamboo is a multi-billion you know, billion dollar industry worldwide, um, but, but you know, that infrastructure in the United States um, hasn't yet been established uh, uh, here. And then again, we're working on this, but um, the, the extension and peer support systems um, aren't quite there yet. Uh, here are the additional sources that I promised you. Uh, here is the uh, IPIS extension, uh, extension document for bamboo control um, by Jay Farrell and his colleagues. Um, here's a link to the graph I showed you of the bamboo risks. Uh, this is, was published in the Journal for Nature Conservation. Um, so you can access that article here. Um, and then here is a PDF of how to identify native bamboos. And then finally, uh, here's a plug for our website, assessment.ifis.ufl.edu. Um, again, we offer information on nine, 900 species. Uh, and then you can email me directly uh, here at dmlorant at ufl.edu. Uh, and with that, I will thank, you know, here's the, the team that put together uh, the fact sheet and our extension agencies, you know, our extension um, affiliations, um, as well as uh, Susan Canavan for providing those excellent maps uh, and sharing the picture of her mom. Um, so uh, that, that, that's... Uh, that should do it. Uh, I'm ready for questions. Okay, thank you, Dee. I appreciate that. A quick, well, a couple quick notes, folks. If you have questions, go ahead and type those into the chat window. Uh, we have a couple already. I've got those uh, over here, and I'll read those out. And also, uh, Dr. Lorenz put up a couple of websites uh, just like two slides before this. I will go ahead and put those on that forestrywebinars.net. Yeah, we could just leave it right here. You can get them this way. We can also put those on the forestrewebinars.net site as well uh, for folks that come later on. Those will be there. So let's get into the questions. Uh, Dia, I want to ask you something. Is there a time when it is OK to plant bamboo, a time or a situation? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think, personally, uh, I think bamboo is I think it, planting clumping bamboos for landscaping purposes 
could be okay. I personally wouldn't do it just because um, as bamboo continues to grow um, to even get a lands a big clump of landscaped bamboo out of your front yard um, requires uh, folks to come dig it out. Uh, it bumps me out. I, I will be honest. Uh, I, I think bamboo is a really cool plant. And uh, when I first started doing research on this and thinking about it as a, a possible crop, um, I, I was kind of rooting for it, so to speak. But, uh, but just looking at how hard it is to remove it once it becomes established, um, I, I wouldn't personally recommend it in my, I guess professionally recommend it in my professional opinion. Um, but as far as bamboo, at least the clumping bamboo in Florida, for commercial production. My concerns aren't as much about the invasion risk of those clumping bamboos in, in big mass plantings. My, my concerns lie more in um, whether or not we have any proof uh, that these people are going to make money on it. And so as an extension professional, if a farmer comes to me and asks me if they should plant the species, I can't really say yes or no because it's not proven. Um, so I tend to err on the side of caution and I would lean to to no for that. Excellent. All right, all, about, all sorts of questions coming in here. I'm trying to keep up. Um, let me just start with this, Dia. Um, is there a good resource for identifying bamboo species, especially for distinguishing the many non-native cultivated species from our native aren't areas? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I was speaking with uh, with Susan uh, Canavan, so she just joined our lab um, to do some some work on another species um, outside of the bamboo world, but. She she did four full years on bamboos, looking at um, looking at various aspects of of you know what exists out there in the literature, um, down to the biology and and the, the invasion risk where she is. Um, I asked her about you know do you have any resources on how to identify these things and uh, you know she was saying that it it can be very difficult to decipher what is what. Um, I think that I don't have those resources, but I can provide uh, what what she recommended is that if you're coming across these bamboos um, to get a good herbarium speci uh, quality specimen and submit that to whatever agency you have available that does identification. So. Um, I know what we have here in Florida. You can have you can have things identified by Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry. Um, we also have some identification um, resources within our extension network, um, as well as uh, going to your closest herbarium. Um, they usually have folks uh, folks that that can do those identifications. Uh, and the resource that I can I can try to pull together is uh, how to get the right the right sample to get it identified. So. Yeah, another uh, thing I'll just I'll just add. Try your your county extension or your state extension. All of us have a mm -hmm. land grant university or institution in our state. I would start there. There's usually somebody at that uh, in that extension service that knows their plants, and that's kind of a good way good way to go. Um, another one, Dia, this is a, this is a really good one. Uh, this is from Jill Swearington. With the invasiveness and management difficulty posed by exotic bamboos and the huge need to grow native plants and make them available throughout the U.S. for residential, commercial, and natural habitat restoration, I would love to see the focus of growers shift away from these problematic bamboos towards native shrubs, trees, and some tall grasses as substitutes. Uh, personally, I think bamboo should be banned. The question, are there any efforts being made to push the native alternatives approach? So I'm guessing this would be on a um, on a smaller scale. So for landscaping purposes, um, 
Yeah. Uh, of course, I agree with most of that. Um, I, I think, know. I think, <laughs> I think the bamboo should, I think we should push our natives and, and, and in terms of an organized effort within, uh, the University of Florida, uh, we do have, um, some programs to get lawns, um, so certified, quote unquote, Florida friendly. Um, so the Florida friendly program, you can get certifications and it's a point of pride for, for folks, um, um, looking at, uh, trying to get, get these non-natives out of their yard. Um, so it's silver if you get all the prohibited species in the state out of your lawn, um, and it's gold if you get all your prohibited and your invasive not recommended by the IFAS assessment, my program, out of your, your lawn. So there are different certification programs like that, I would guess, around the region. Um, it's just something that we maybe it, we're identifying um, room to provide more extension guidance and maybe come up with um, a clearinghouse for those kind of programs that we can share with share with folks. Um, but in terms of incentives on a larger scale, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, there's a couple questions on this, and, in, and I also want to get to some of the management ones, but I will just say that, um, yes, we as professionals know a lot of non-native stuff gets planted. Yes, we are trying to get that change to where people plant native things, but at the end of the day, uh, places will produce what people will buy. So until mm -hmm. people stop requesting um, mimosa trees in their yard or stop requesting bamboo to grow and stop planting bread for pears, places are going to keep making those things because they sell. So there's, yeah. you know, it, and it's it, it sounds easy to say, well, can't you just ban the sale of that stuff? It doesn't doesn't work that way because there's very influential entities that do not want things like that banned because it's how they make their money. So at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to change this is a drop in consumer demand. So yeah. I will just leave it at that, happy to, to talk offline with anyone. But I want to get to a couple questions about control. Uh, one that came up twice, can you use... Uh, prescribed fire to control bamboo? Um, out of my expertise, uh, but if I were to um, think about this, I, I think if you are using fire, um, whew, uh, and, and I'll chime in if you want, Dia. Gosh, I'm just thinking it would, it, is the fire going to get high enough to affect the top? It's, is it going to get hot enough to affect the, the roots? Um, I'm not sure it would be the best method. Well, what hunch, do you think, David? Yeah, my hunch seeing, you know, fire in forested areas, I think fire will, would probably top kill a lot of it, but I don't think it would kill it. So it might be one of those deals where if you've got a lot of dead, uh, dead material on the ground, you, you might be able to run a fire through there and clear all that away. And then when the new growth came, that would be the stuff to hit with, um, with chemicals. We do that for a, a lot of other invasives where we basically take fire as a way to just clear off all the crap on top. When all the new growth comes up, that's really susceptible to chemicals. And then you have sort of a two-tiered approach. But fire on its own generally it does not kill stuff, uh, not invasive stuff anyway. So my hunch would be probably not, but it might help control it some. Um, someone also asked, you had that big treatment table in there. That is available. Um, oh, and Joe Vaughn, bamboo leaf litter will not carry fire under prescribed fire conditions. So there you go. It's, fire is mm -hmm. probably not going to be a good option at all. Um, there was a big table in in that presentation about treatments, that is in the uh, the fact sheet that we produce that I believe is on the, um, it's one of the PDFs you can download on that forestrywebinars.net uh, page for this thing, so it is there. And then there's a question about hexazinone. I'm hearing rumors that hexazinone may be effective for bamboo. Any information on that? The, uh, I'm happy to take this if you'd like. Take it. From what I know about hexazinone, uh, it can work on bamboo, but you have to be careful because that one gets activated, you know, with water. So if you've got 
trees and other stuff in the nearby vicinity, it's going to also kill them. So it's a very broad spectrum herbicide. Put it on the ground, activate it in water. So, you know, it probably could work in a case where you just had the bamboo. But, you know, how much it's going to, it's going to run, the hexazinone, I mean, is going to depend on kind of how much water comes in there. So I would say you have to exercise extreme caution with that one, especially if you've got a patch next to a uh, woods or a landscape tree that you're trying to keep. Okay. Folks, with that, you know, there are a couple questions we couldn't get to. Feel free to email a spike for bamboo control. Boy, I, I do not know. And this is one of the things, just real quick, is we don't have a lot of good scientific evidence for what works on bamboo control. You know, there's not been a lot of real good studies done. Uh, Dia has done some of the, you know, to my knowledge, some of the uh, best, most comprehensive work on the invasiveness of it. But as far as controlling it, I think we're still kind of in our infancy. Um, you know, we, we have an idea of stuff that will work, but we're just not sure. You know, and, and this issue of planting bamboo on a grand scale comes up every few years, uh, more so in the deep south versus up in the Carolinas and such. But, um, you know, like, like Dr. Lorenz said, there's a reason pine grows everywhere. We have the infrastructure to harvest it. We know how to plant it. Yes, bamboo will grow places. It may grow faster, but then what do you do with it? We just don't have that infrastructure here. To, to, to get the actual harvest and get that done. Anyway, I want to thank Dr. Lorenz for her time today, and thank you for giving us all this great information. These websites are up here. Um, feel free to get a hold of us if you have questions. And with that, thank you, Dr. Lorenz. And I will push out the link you folks need for your credits. So give me one moment. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.